What's up, everybody? It's Brian Clayton, CEO, co-founder of GreenPal, here with you doing a Q&A uh, for AO. Let's get into it. I'm here to answer some questions for you guys. Hopefully, I can help you guys out and help you avoid some mistakes that I've made along the way. First question from Ari Brown. How do you fire a client when your only basis is they're difficult and not willing to change? Well, you can look at this one or two ways, and I guess it kind of depends on where you're at in the life cycle of your business. If your business is mature and you're making money, you're profitable, and you are at a good place, you're growing, you're working a plan, then you can be a little more what customers you want to work for. You can be a little more selective about who's a good fit for your business and who's not. Uh, but I believe that when you're first getting started and you have like less than 100K, 500K in revenue, I think you really kind of have to grab and hold on to every customer you can get because that's kind of the life lifeblood of your business. So my answer is depends. If if it's the beginning of your business and you're first getting started, let's say let's say you're a home remodeling contractor and and uh, you you have a, a neighborhood of customers you're working with and maybe may like a condo association and a lot of particular people live there and they just get feed off of that. You know, you really kind of have to just do whatever it takes to get through, get through that and, and serve them and, and generate that revenue. But let's say you're, you're in year three, four, five and you're doing well. Well, then a lot of it boils down to like your personal happiness as a business owner and your personal health and your mental health and your well-being and negative customers will drain the life out of you. They will suck the soul out of you. And so then, then you're at a point where you can be a little more selective about who you want to work for and, and who, and who's not a good fit. So let's say you are a little more established, you're profitable. Uh, you can be a little more selective about who, who you're working with. The, the best thing I have found is to do more than you think you should. So if you, you can either do less uh, do do the same amount uh, of hand holding or do more. I think you should do more. Because, and here's why: because if somebody's pissed off at you and feels like you did them wrong, uh, no matter what you do, uh, they're going to barbecue you on every review site out there on the internet: Yelp, Google, Facebook, all of these places that that there might be industry specific ones. And it's just not worth that. With a little more finesse and a little more work, you can you can hand them off well. And so here's Here's what I have found. I have found that if you keep a list of names and numbers of competitors that you know are good fits for some of these people, or maybe just be, or maybe you're just getting started, and you call the, you call this person on the phone. If they won't answer the phone, write them an email or text message and say, "Hey, Mrs. Smith, I really appreciate the opportunity of working with you. I've actually grown my business to a point where I can no longer take on all of my workload, so unfortunately, I won't be able to take care of you anymore." But the good news is, is I went ahead and found three other options for you, and I let them know to expect your phone call. And they're about the same price and quality as me, and, and they'll be taking care of you from here. I apologize. I wish I could take care of you this season, but I just can't because my business has outgrown uh, what I'm capable of already doing. And then just leave it at that. Uh, they're not going to be happy, but they really won't have rational grounds to go and, and leave you bad reviews uh, based on that. So, so my answer is first, it depends. If you're just getting started, Suck it up, work for whoever you can work for and, and get the revenue going and then learn, build systems and then attract the kind of customer you want to work with. And then people who aren't good fits for that system, weed them out, hand them off to, to competitors. You're, you know, you'll, you'll build some good networking in the industry. You'll build some good uh, relationships with other people that you're feeding work to. And uh, that's the best way to handle it. Next question. <clears throat> Which is better onboarding training, a private YouTube channel or Trainual? I am in the process of redoing my onboarding and want to add videos for all aspects of the scope of work or standard operating procedures. I don't know if private YouTube channel will be better 
or something more detailed such as Tranual would be better suited for a company wanting to get to a franchise level. This is from Heather Brockman. Okay, so step one, it's good that you uh, are systemizing the training process, systemizing the onboarding process, using tools, uh, you, you know, taking advantage of, of technology to make this smoother and faster and more uh, uniform and repetitive and standardized. So that's good. So, so you're doing good by, by already getting started doing that. The question of Tranual versus YouTube, uh, that, that depends on if you are just getting started on a shoestring budget and cost control is like one of the major things that you, you have that you have in your favor to, to get this business going, then, then take the free option. Go with a YouTube. Um, every hundred dollars a month counts. Every two hundred dollars a month counts. If you can save a thousand dollars a month and and uh, and you're and you're doing like ten percent in profits, well, that's like ten grand in sales. So so in the early days, uh, do every free option you can. If Trainual has a free tier that you can stay under, go with it. If, if it's like 50 or or $100 a month, then save that money if you're on a bootstrap shoestring budget. Now, if, if your business is already doing a, a 100K in sales or, or a 500K in sales or a million in sales, then invest in the suite, uh, the tool suite to make this easier. It'll be well worth it. Uh, and, and, and caveat to the first answer, it, once you put it on YouTube, you're going to have to put it on a training specific platform anyway, sooner or later after you get over a sales growth. You can't franchise something and say, oh, go watch my YouTube videos in this private channel. That just looks janky in my opinion. Uh, so for professionalism and and uh, uniformity and also the, 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 the tool sets that, that, that Trainio is probably going to give you around, uh, did they finish the course? Did they, did they score well on it? Uh, did they did they uh, answer the Q and A? Did they uh, you know or 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 did they just turn it on and let it play? That's going to be well worth whatever training will cost you. So so if you're on a shoestring budget, get started with something free and then graduate to a free tool. But if you can if you can afford it and it's a no brainer on the costs, then just go ahead and pay for training or or an even better tool. It'll be well worth the, the amount of money you spend, and it'll make your business look more professional to the employee coming on board. And and you know if you said something about franchising, it'll certainly make it more professional to the franchisers. Like that's just a no brainer. YouTube, you know, YouTube is is going to be seen as like almost uh, cheap and and like, am I really getting on board with a real business here that having me watch YouTube videos? So balance the decision based on that feedback. Free if you're on a shoestring budget. If you can afford it, spend spend the money on the tool. It'll be it'll pay you back in terms of better training, uh, more engagement from people, and a, and just a better impression about your business. Gabor. Rants, he asks, what are some quick wins I can implement to increase our bottom line profitability and how should I go about doing them in the long term? Background on the question, throughout the past two years, I've been focused on growing top line revenue and this year we're on track to hit 1 million in sales. Congratulations. We've been profitable all the way, but I feel like there's probably a lot of waste we could eliminate. Normally I'm a sales guy, not the savings guy, but I'm not sure how to get started as well as how to make constant awareness to our bottom line an integral part of how we do business. We currently have a full-time accountant who can get me the reports I need. So one million in sales, how do you, how do you increase the bottom line? Well, there, there's a, several ways you can approach it. One is just look for the quick wins. Uh, one of my favorite favorite uh, quotes is by Warren Buffett. He says, I don't look at $100 like $100. I look at it like $1,000 because that's ultimately what it'll grow to become. So Warren Buffett's big on compound interest and he understands that if he can invest $100 that it'll grow to be $1,000. So if you can take that mindset and look at everything your business is doing and how you can cut every cost out of the business without affecting the customer experience, 
take it, do it. Because even if it's just a hundred dollars a month, it'll eventually be a thousand dollars a month. And so I, I have done this in businesses in the past for me, you know, everything from the, 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 the water filter we have in the office that we're spending $120 a month on with putting bottles of water. Why do we need that? Let's just install a, a water filter, a tank, a, 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 a water filter on the, on the tap. It's fine. It'll be, it, it we'll get by with it. Uh, that saves us, you know, thousand dollars a year, or $1,500 a year to, uh, you mentioned you have a full-time accountant. Well, if you're only doing a million dollars in sales, I'm taking, I'm reading that to say, to, to say that you got an accountant on salary. That's, that's a little premature. So what if we could take that accountant that who's making, I don't know, 50 K hundred K and, and get them and get them down on a, uh, on a freelance basis where you're paying them maybe 500 or a thousand dollars a month. Um, so, so stuff like, like, a lot of times there's waste in the operations on what we're spending in, in labor and salary. So looking for ways to consolidate some of those roles uh, and do, do more with less people and, and offloading some of these people who you have as full-time employees to, uh, into like contractors and freelancers might be a, might be a way to do it. Uh, virtual, uh, you, you can look for uh, virtual uh, assistants to do a lot of the administrative things that's going on in your business. Like, do you have somebody answering the phone all the time that you're paying to sit, to sit in the chair? You can, you can pay somebody virtually to do that for you. Uh, who's doing your bookkeeping? Are they full-time? Maybe you can pay somebody virtual to help you with that. Anything that can be done with a computer screen can be done anywhere in the world now. And so ways to like uh, reduce what you're spending on salary and, and pay somebody uh, to do it part-time virtually can, can get you better return, can get you better results and, uh, and, and, and save you money. So that's an option. Um, and then looking for ways to drive the the operational efficiency of your business. And, and you notice we haven't talked anything about sales. You say you're a sales guy, so it sounds like you sounds like you're focused on that. That's great. So like like how do we how do we drive the operational efficiency of the business in terms of how do we reduce waste? How do we reduce dead time? How do we reduce callbacks? And uh, you know if you're not on like one central nervous system to run your whole business, um, there's an opportunity for that to 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 make it run more efficient, like a, a symptom of, of inefficient business is paper, believe it or not. Like, are you passing a lot of paper around? Uh, that's a symptom of, of an inefficient process. It really should just be a screen. There should be one s uh, software suite that, that is dedicated to your industry that you're running the entire business on. And by the way, these are things that are going to help you get from million to five million to 10 million. You know, growing my last company to, to 10 million in revenue before I sold it. A lot of the way we were able to get to 10 million in sales was was just through systems and 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 relying on on technology to get there. My current business is doing 20 million dollars in sales. It's a, it's a strictly a technology business. So the more you can uh, implement tech into your business, the better it'll run. The the better it, it will be more efficient and the less waste that that you'll be causing. So so that's a good way to to drive uh, revenue to the bottom line. So really just trying to Focus on one piece of it at a time and eliminate as much waste you can in terms of things you're paying for that you don't necessarily need, people you're paying that you necessarily could uh, use a, a, a virtual assistant for or a, or a contractor for, and and then what do the workflows look like in your business and, and where are they sloppy and, and tuning those and making those more efficient. That's how you make more profit. And I think you're smart for, for, for taking this approach. Next question. <clears throat> Robin Turbin asks, time management. What what time management system or process do you use and why? I want to be as productive as I can be, and I know there is software and good old fashioned day planners. What what are you using today to be efficient and manage your time? I don't think there's one silver bullet that just makes you become a productive person. So um, there's there's a there's a philosophy in in problem solving is if if your problem is a tree, are you going to hack at the leaves or hack at the at the trunk and the root? And you really want to like asking what software solution is more hacking at the leaves. You really want to hack at the root. 
and and figure out okay what is the routine I'm doing to stay productive and not waste time and that's gonna boil back more towards philosophies and principles than it is software which is like a counter it's just like a like like a a contradictive answer to my previous response was software 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 this I mean yes yeah, software can help you but that software is just going to tune, like if you're 90% productive already and you're not wasting a bunch of time, software is going to tune the last 10% because this is more relates to like personal discipline and personal uh, accountability. And so for me, you know, my tool set is really simple. I use, a, I use a tool called Trello, which is great for externalizing everything that I have to get done, whether it be me or my team or my sales team or my op ops team or my dev team or my marketing team or everybody's got their own every team gets their own Trello board and I'm managing the different teams and tasks uh, and making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. But it's not like Trello like takes me from uh, a, a, a unproductive person to a productive person. It's like I was already like getting stuff done. Trello just kind of tunes it. So I would really like focus on getting the personal accountability piece solved. And, and that might just relate to goal setting um, for yourself personally, it might just be, be relate to, uh, hitting, like laying out a number and, and, and th that's like, like, like what, what the goal you're going to hit is. And then that's like an output metric and then focus on the input metrics. And so this concept of output metrics and input metrics helps a lot of this productivity because it's like you, you are held accountable to get the stuff done. Um, and so, so like an output metric might be, uh, well, we're going to have to increase sales by 50% this month. Audacious goal. Okay, great. What's the input metric? Well, uh, it means that normally we see 20 people a week, but now we're going to have to see 50. Okay, so what's that mean? Okay, well, that means 10 people a day. And that means like a person every hour and a half. And so like the input metrics, it's like I got to call a person every hour and a half. You know, you know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying? So, so. When it comes to like personal productivity, it's 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 less like the tool and software, and it's like the bigger operational piece, and then the tool is like the layer on the top that kind of kind of holds it together. Just and and you don't really have to overthink that. Just get the best in class that there's out there today that works for you. For me, it's Trello, but but the, the I would in, encourage you to really hack at the the root and not the leaves. Hack at the 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 essence of the problem and not like the symptoms of it. Next question is from Sarah Hamilton. How do I build loyalty with my team? I own a female run and operated barbershop for male clients. And over the years, I have had countless barbers screw me over in all kinds of areas. The way they talk to me, the way they won't follow processes, they quit on me and I can't seem to find a solution. This industry is very unique and I'm looking for any and all ideas to make sure I am being the right leader and keep people and grow. How do I know if I'm the problem and if I'm not doing my job or if it's just people will be the problem? Well, Sarah, I empathize with you. I used to run a landscaping company uh, and I built it from just me and a push mower to me and 150 employees. And so I, I understand how that, how you, how you feel. I understand that sometimes it can feel like people aren't loyal and, and everybody's out to screw you. Because certainly that's how that's how it feels and how how it looks. But the reality is, this is not happening to you. It's happening for you. People leaving your business and going somewhere else. People stabbing you in the back. People uh, not being loyal to your business. Uh, it's happening for you as a business owner, because it can help you build a better business, grow as a leader, build a better culture in your little business. Uh, it's all of these things that 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 can help make your business better, stronger, and make you a better entrepreneur. So that's the first thing. I would reframe the problem because the tone of your question is exactly how I have felt in my life, where it's just like you get screwed over time and time and time again by people that work for you. And you just feel like, is anybody worth a crap? And, and why am I doing this? And so I, I can definitely empathize, but you have to reframe this problem that these things are happening not to you as the owner, but for you. And every time they happen, it can, it can offer as an opportunity for you to build a better business. And so the first thing is, ask why 
why they are leaving. Like, hey, you know, hey, it's going to be my last day. Oh, that sucks. Okay, I understand. Why are you going somewhere? Well, because I can go over to the shop and make more money. Uh, you know what? I understand. If it doesn't work out, come on back. And you have to really understand, why can they go to that other shop and make more money? And and if they can, if it's like a, uh, if it's, if it's and, I, and I don't mean to, to ascribe this to your business, but if it's like the difference between super cuts and a really high-end shop in town that charges $75, then yeah, they can graduate and go make more money over at the other shop. And you can't blame them for that. Um, and Supercuts, I think their model is probably dependent more on turnover. They have a training system where they understand that, that they're just going to they're gonna turn over these people uh, every six weeks, and that's their business model. If that's not your business model, then, then you have to figure out, okay, how do I train these people on, on my system? And then how do I create an environment where they can win and they can get what they want? Because you as the business owner, you, you have to help your employees get what they want. Everybody in this world is going to optimize for their own needs. They're not going to optimize for your needs. They will fall in line and run your system and, and, and work your process if it helps them get what they want. And so what they want, you need to find that out. Is it, is it a way to make $1,000 a week or $2,000 a week? Then you have to figure out how you can build the system to get them there. Um, is it a way to learn how to cut hair? Are you more on like the, the lower end of the spectrum where, where these are people just fresh out of, out of uh, barber school? Um, then you have to build a system to get them there. You know, so, so you have to really dial into what is it that your people want and help them get there. And if you don't figure that out, then you'll constantly have this problem of people leaving and, and going somewhere else that can get them what they want. The next thing is after you figure that out, you can really try to treat this family as uh, treat this business as a, as a, as a family and, and like a major league baseball team at the same time or, or any professional sports team, sports team, like professional sports teams. They, they, they keep the best. They, they only recruit the best. They, they expel the ones, expel the players to trade or fire the ones that aren't good. And so, so if you can, you can run the, this thing as a professional sports organization with a little bit of family uh, dynamic that can help be glue to retain the best people and to and and to uh, attract the best people, because part of the problem might be that you know you're attracting B and C players, and guess what? A players don't want to be around B and C players, so it's kind of a self fulfilling like death spiral. So that could be another another aspect of it. And the last piece of advice I'll, I'll leave you with: as business owners, we get exactly the culture that we deserve. We get exactly the work environment that we deserve. We get exactly the vibe inside the business that we deserve. The business is a reflection of us. So I've, and I've been here and I've been in business for 25 years and there's been years of my business where I would, I would be driving to my office and I would have this like bad like feeling in my stomach, like a pit, in my, like, a, like a, somebody punched me in the gut. And, and I was like, oh, I just don't want to go here. I hate this place. I hate everybody that works here. I hate every customer we have. And like, I have felt that way. And it took me a while to learn from, from, from business uh, mentors and leadership mentors that, that the business is a reflection of me. It's a reflect. I've built it. I have hired every person that worked there. I, I have, this is the culture I have, I have made. And so you have to change. You have to, over time, improve your, the way you're framing this and the way that, you know, like, and, I, and I'm not like all rah-rah personal uh, psychology can just fix all problems and good attitude can fix all problems, but it certainly helps. And so it has to start with you. It has to start with, with your attitude because if, it, if that's not right, then it doesn't matter what you do. Um, if, if, if you're not pleasant to work with, if you're not pleasant to be around, if you're not, if you're not creating a fun environment, um, then, then nothing else, nothing else matters. Um, so start, it starts with you, um, and understand that no matter what happens, it's, it's, ref, it's a reflection of, of, of the, 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 the attitude that you're bringing to the, to the equation. And so, so get that, get that dialed in as well. Um, some books I would recommend would be basically everything John Maxwell has ever wrote or written. You can, you can go back and, and look at, uh, 
some leadership books that John Maxwell has written, and next it can help you. Uh, it can help you figure out kind of your leadership style, um, because we're all born terrible leaders. I, like I, I've spent years of my business career uh, leading horribly, and it's and and it's gotten me in situations like 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 the one you're describing. Uh, the other thing I would read is uh, the E Myth. Uh, it's a good book about how you create a, a humming, systemized, organized business that people want to come work work for. And I would I would be reading a book every month. If if you're not gonna, inv- you gotta invest in yourself. You gotta you gotta if you want to level up as a business owner and and grow this thing and 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 make a thriving business, then you're gonna have to level up. That's one of the beautiful things about business. So uh, that's my that's my feedback. That's my advice. I hope it helps. Next question is from Dan Razumoski. What is the best way to get a customer to follow through with leaving a review? When finished with a deck project, I buy my homeowners a nice little bottle of wine, $1,500. I ask them to leave me a review on the platforms, but it does not happen. The projects I am doing are anywhere from 15 to 65K. I'm looking to grow my exterior contracting company, a million dollars in profitable sales. I am going to open more locations once all implemented systems are working, looking to extend to large loss insurance claims. All right, Dan, great question. Because reviews are really, really, really important. Anything related to the home, reviews are huge. And so how do you get somebody to leave you a good review? Well, it sounds like you've already got a good a, a good little process. You're leaving them. Uh, you're giving them a nice bottle of wine. Okay, so th- so you say fifty to one hundred twenty dollar range. That sounds way too high. Uh, most people like I drink wine, and I got to be honest with you, I don't know the difference between a twenty dollar bottle of wine and a hundred twenty dollar bottle of wine. So you're probably wasting money there. I would just go with a decent twenty dollar bottle of wine. I love that idea. Great idea. But you got some money you can save there. Um. The first thing is <clears throat> I would not press harder. Like I've been on, I do a lot of, a lot of traveling around the world and TripAdvisor is like the lifeblood of a lot of these um, guides that you can experience or, or, uh, or, or, or like excursions you can book. And man, I have been on some of these excursions and at the end the, the guide will say, hey, will you leave us a good review on, on TripAdvisor? Sure, yeah, no problem. No, I want to see you do it. <laughs> like, I have seen them do this. Like, they will, I've experienced this. They will make you leave the review right there in front of them. Don't do that. Super awkward, super uncomfortable. So if you've thought about that, I would, I would recommend against that. Um, so, so the first thing I would do is I would implement some kind of system uh, a, a, a CRM that does this for you uh, and kind of nags them just a little bit. And so I think there's one called bird eye and there's, there's, there's a, there's a dozen of these. I, I, and my, my business is, is, is we, we solicit reviews and we have, we've built a custom made system. And what it does is after the, after they sign up for service, they get service. Uh, then it sends them a text and an email uh, asking them to leave a review. And then it tracks if they do or they don't. And if they do, then it leaves them alone. If they don't, it reminds them every like week or so. I would recommend implementing a system like that. I, I believe one is called Bird Eye. I've seen it advertised because that'll help you with a lot of it. It's like it sends them a little text message with a picture, you know, maybe of your logo, of your face, or whatever. You with a thumbs up, like, hey, did you did you like the how's the deck working out? And that's another th- the other thing too is you can layer this in with follow up. Um, and so it's like maybe two weeks later, Hey, how's the deck? You know, an automatic thing that happens to every customer. How is the deck working out? Is there any cracks? Is the paint peeling and are any boards squeaky? Uh, are, you know, everything cool, you know, like, uh, one thing you can expect is, is as the pressure treating wears off, it might change color just a little bit. I just want to make sure you're completely happy. So layer in the solicitation of the review with follow up. So you kind of it's kind of like a like hitting two birds with one stone. You're you're following up like at the two week mark, two month part, six month 
uh, uh, milestone, and it's making sure they're happy. And so this will do a couple things. It'll 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 make them warm and fuzzy, tee them up, get them all warm to leave a review, and then also to help you with word of mouth. It's like you know what this guy, this 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 guy, uh, uh, Dan, he is he's like I wish my I wish my dentist uh, had the kind of customer service my deck builder does. Like, I, like you want to like just knock their socks off with the follow up, and then layer in the ask for the review along with that. It's like, it's like, hey, uh, so so, uh, you know, uh, how's the deck treating you? It's good. Uh, no nails popping up, or anything like that. Awesome. Um, if if you don't mind, uh, reviews really help me. Would you mind leaving me a good review at on Yelp? Here's the link. And I would do all of this manually at first with spreadsheets, follow up, leave, followed up on March 23rd, leave a review, yes, no, okay, follow back up in three weeks. And I would track it all with spreadsheets. And then I would look for a way to systemize all of it with a, with a software tool that I could buy. Hope that helps. Great question. Next question from Zach Nock. How do you start a training program for employees? What are the bare bones structure needed for a successful training program? My company, Diamond State Technologies, specializes in working with access control, cameras, automation, security systems for both residential and commercial applications. The reason why I'm asking this question is I'm growing rapidly. I need guidance on how to build a six month training program for my techs. Thank you mentors for your irreplaceable knowledge so it's kind of a similar question to one that was already asked i would go like sounds like your business is growing i would i would definitely uh, go with a with a system a, a a platform that people can interact with and i would break this down into just small bite sizable chunks like five minutes at a time and i would have new recruits go through a through a, a like a university like like the uh, the Zach Knock Security Systems University, and and I would have this I would have this go on for like maybe 14 days, and and then and that would like get them uh, up to snuff on on your culture, on your systems, on your on why and how you guys do what you do, and I wouldn't overthink it. I would do everything that I'm already doing, training a new employee, and then I would figure out how to map that to a, a video series. And so it's like step one. You know, hey, welcome aboard. Thanks for coming on. Like, uh, here's your employee. Uh, here's your uniform. You got to wear this thing every day. We well, need to be clean. Um, and he, and the reason why is because our 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 business is the best in the market. We actually care about our presentation. If you notice, all of our trucks and vans are clean, and like that's why it's important. And we want the customer to feel uh, confident that they've hired the right security company because appearance really matters in this business and so that's why it's important your shirt is is free of any stains and and we'll issue you a new set of uh of uniforms every other monday whatever like just going through you videotaping this and you can almost just like the first iteration of this just just walk through what you're doing with a new employee and videotape it you don't have, you don't have to overthink it and then like i would have like questions around every little module and everything from like what to expect day one, what to do on their, uh, on their first day, when every, you know, when people get paid, um, what are the, what are the, pro what's the, the protocol when they get to a, uh, a customer's property and like, what are the 10, 12 things like checklists that, that they have to do? Like I would read a book called the checklist manifesto. And this is a book about, uh, you know, why do airplanes never, you know, rarely crash? It's because pilots follow this rigorous uh, checklist. Every, the whole world, like, of systems runs on checklists. And so I would have, I would have, like, checklists in the business, and then the training system would cover these checklists, and then I would have questions on how people understand how, how all of it comes together. So the bigger piece of my advice is to not overthink it. Just get the first iteration out. When I say iteration, it's, like, it's the first, like, attempt. And then keep improving it because you really don't know the extent of what this training system needs to needs to look like. Just get something out there and get it bouncing off of new employees. And then 
and then like get their feedback and like maybe check in with them a month later. It's like, hey, the training system, where were you still confused? Or when they actually, when they screw up and they do something wrong, like, okay, now I need to figure out where I screwed up on my training system. And so that's the really, that's the really good thing. It's like, uh, employees are going to screw up. They're going to do things that, that, that are outside of the processes of the, of the business. And then you get to go back and figure out where did I mess up on my training system? Was it not, did I not make them watch three videos on the same topic? Did I not go into depth enough? Were the questions not hard enough? So you can tune it. So step one, get the first, first version out. Step two, uh, figure out feedback from people who are using it. Step three, uh, go back to the training system every time somebody screws up and constantly tune it, make it better and better. Over the course of a year, two years, maybe 10 or 20 or 30 employees go through this thing, then you'll have a good training system. But coming out of the gate with the perfect training system, not going to happen. Final question from Morgan Katz. What strategies do you use to build your network? I work with companies to help them maintain their season tickets to concert venues, sports teams, etc. I am very active on LinkedIn and in person and in person networking events prior to COVID. But looking for new options to add in, I am looking for ways to use networking groups, associations to develop more relationships to get even more in with large customers. We fill in the gaps in corporate ticketing. We help companies manage their season and event tickets. We help keep them compliant, prove trackable data while easing the process of season ticket management. Okay, so I'm not a big networking guy. Like I I just feel like every event I go to, I'm getting bombarded with people who want to sell me stuff. And so I, you know, I don't have the silver bullet answer for your question. Like how do you network better, better? And how do you like extract sales out of people you're networking with? I don't know any good answer to that question because personally it annoys me. Uh, that's why I don't go to networking events. Um, the networking I do happens organically, uh, happens in groups like this. Um, it helps with me mentoring people and I meet, I meet people. So I, like for me, like any sort of networking, I just feel like should happen organically and should, um, it should just like any sales that comes out of it, it just should be like a natural serendipitous result uh, from it. So I would, I wouldn't like look at networking as a sales channel. I guess that's, that's my, my response. It's like, I would not look at like, okay, how do I get more sales out of networking events? And no, that's not how I would look at it. I would, I would really go back to your value proposition and try to figure out, okay, what is a way that I can pitch somebody that solves a problem for them? And, and how do I just be the best at that? And then how do I run a sales process around that? And like, I mean, I could open up my LinkedIn right now and it's got like 480 DMs and that's just from last week and everybody like not everybody but 90% of the people in that DM box are trying to sell me something and so I think that's saturated I think I think the way you know traditional like networking done and, and has do, is done and, and how it can relate to sales is just it's just like over a decade adding value and asking nothing and if you do that enough then naturally you'll you'll get a a, a a reputation and you'll get a robust network of people around you that kind of helps reinforce whatever other sales process you're running. And so if you can literally add value and, and I don't know how that is, maybe it's like, uh, you know, if, if, if you can, you know, people that, that have, uh, events with season tickets, I guess you're trying to sell people to buy season tickets. Um, you know, throw them a free ticket every once in a while. That's, I mean, that's what I would do. And then ask nothing. Don't even pitch them. Like, try to figure out a way to throw a free ticket to a thing, uh, to somebody who might buy one. Um, you might even, like, you might even, like, upgrade somebody's seats every once in a while. Just figure out a way to add value and ask nothing, I think, is how, has how networking can help you uh, achieve your business objectives. But going to a networking event and trying to pitch people is not how I approach it because me personally, I think that's annoying. Uh, actually, we have one more question. Joe Nugent, 
what do you suggest as far as paying independent contractors who I contract to help me facilitate providing my services to my customers? I own a home inspection business and I'm turning away five to eight inspections per week. I'm looking to partner with another inspection company, Solopreneur, who is not as busy so I can make money while working less. How do I do the billing, collect the client, collect from the client and send uh, to inspection company, have them collect or send me a check? Um, okay. It's a good question. A uh, little bit of a slippery slope. So, so uh, contractors are, 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 are difficult because if, if you get somebody on board who's working for you and like you're paying them and, and, and it grows to a point where they're working like 30 or 40 hours a week and their only thing is doing stuff with you, then that's an employee that's not a contractor and that can get you into trouble. So if it's truly a relationship where you are the con your primary contractor, they're the subcontractor, and they're working for themselves on an ongoing basis. They're working for other companies. Um, they have their own business and you're just subcontracting work out to them. Then that can work. But, but if it grows into a point where they're basically like showing up for you every day and like representing your company, they have your company's logo on their, sh on your shirt, uh, then their employee and the state is going to find out about that sooner or later. And then you're going to have a big bill associated with that. So just be careful with the, with the subcontractor thing. Um, the next piece of it is the only thing they should do and touch is the execution of the work um, and and following your process, your checklist, your system. Uh, don't just send them out there to do whatever they want. They have to follow your system and, and then minimize as much as you can in terms of billing, collecting, quoting, because you really kind of want to manage that. You you want to manage the, the customer inbounds to you. You quote them. Hey, okay, it sounds great. Hey, hey listen, uh, my, my, my inspector Jeff is going to be out there on Tuesday. Uh, he'll be there at 830 and it'll take him three hours. When it gets done, uh, we will send you the report and then we'll send you an invoice on Square or PayPal or Stripe or whatever you're using. And then uh, you can just pay us with... Uh, with credit card or, 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 or uh, e-check, whatever. I, I would, I would like ha have them collect them and send me a check. No, I wouldn't do that. I, you need to manage the billing. You need to manage the scheduling. You need to manage all of that in your system and treat this contractor almost as like it's your employee, but they're working for other people. They have to be, or else they're not a contractor. And they're doing their own thing. They're just kind of coming in with you well, a day or two a week, and 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 they're still solo and uh, they're still independent, um, but they're still in your system. You don't want to just let them go do their own thing. They collect a check, they give you a cut or whatever. You need to handle all of that through your business. And just imagine, imagine it as if it is your employee, and this is part of your business, and the contractor is just kind of filling in the gap a little bit. That's how I would approach it. Thanks, everybody. I had a great time. I will see y'all next month. Y'all keep uh, working hard. Keep grinding. Keep up the slog. Uh, your business is your path to freedom. It is the thing that can help you make something of yourself. Your business. We are all lucky to be in business for ourselves. We're all lucky to be in a country in a place where we can we can choose our own destiny and, and chart our own course through life by building a business that perhaps one day we could sell or hand off to our family. What an awesome thing. So yeah, everybody keep, everybody keep working hard and, and, and improving their station in life. And I will see y'all next month. Peace.